Cool. Well, yeah, again, yeah, thanks everyone for sticking with it and tuning in here. Um, we're really stoked about the upcoming Bitcoin having live stream that we're putting on with the Kraken team. And uh, yesterday we did make a big announcement that we got Davey, J Davey Day Trader, Dave Portnoy, who will be joining us on the stream too. So um, we got some more announcements coming soon, but uh, excited to have El Prez there uh, with uh, with the Kraken team. It's going to be going to be a blast. But um, yeah, for, for today's convo, I think uh, Tomas, um, you know, first of all, if you could just like introduce yourself to the audience and, and share a little bit of the work that you do at Kraken. And um, we'd also just kind of love to pick your brain more on the market in general, how you're seeing uh, market activity as we ramp up to the halving and maybe how this compares to, to what's happened previously. But um, yeah, before we, we dig in there and start kicking that around, we'd love if you could just introduce yourself to the audience and, and tell them a little bit more about yourself. Sure. My name is Tomas Profumo. I've been with Kraken for about six and a half years now, and I've held a few different roles, but over the last um, three and a half years or so, I've been leading the strategy team. You can think of strategy here at Kraken, at least my team, focused on curating the long-term strategic vision of the company and then helping to unify different strategies within the company. You can think of them as like product strategy, marketing strategy, stuff like that. Um, prior to Kraken, I used to work in investment management with an expertise in event-driven U.S. equities for the most part. And I've been interested in, involved in the crypto space um, since 2013. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. And I think, you know, given the fact that you've been around it in, in the industry for so long, I think, um, you know, you've had... Uh, a little bit more experience with the having than I have. I, I joined in 2020, so um, definitely curious to pick your brain there. And um, yeah, maybe you can just tell us a little bit more about uh, you know what the Kraken team is seeing as far as like industry trends as it relates to Bitcoin, um, and, and just general like interest in in Bitcoin as as we've approached the having. I know that there was kind of like um, you know a retail oriented spike uh, a few months ago, uh, especially with the launch of the ETFs. Um, but maybe you can just give us a little bit more insight into like what boots on the ground have been like um, over on your side. Yeah, I mean, as you know, there's sort of this idea of history rhymes, at least in crypto. This is the fourth halving, so there isn't too much, call it statistically significant data to, to work off of. But what we've seen is there's usually a lead up in, of interest in going into the halving. So you start to see price levels rise. You see sort of market cycle peaks 12 to 18 months after the halving uh, trough within 12 to 13 months after that. And then, of course, you start the next halving cycle from there, recover into peak. And um, over the, the last few halving cycles, you've seen different kind of lead lag relationships. You know, the, the creation of the Ethereum ICO right before the having or interest in Bitcoin more broadly. Um, you have things like NFT booms, DeFi summer. So some of these events have been commingled with the having. I think the most recent one, of course, is the Bitcoin ETF uh, coming in only a few months, three months prior to the having in the US anyway. And you're right, as far as interest in the industry price levels, um, the activity of individuals getting into crypto, we're definitely seeing peak activity since 2021 when you had the last sort of bull run up cycle and um, that's been unabated so even going into march of course with all-time highs it tends to be very correlated with price levels and so uh, i think bitcoin performance has definitely been leading the show here um, and uh, and we'll see how it continues going into the having because it's coming in a little early versus prior experiences Yeah, I, I think, uh, I mean, we said at the beginning when we reopened this this spaces room, uh, we're back. And uh, it definitely feels that way. A bit of a foreign feeling after just like an absolutely grueling bear market. Um, but definitely encouraging to see like the increase in activity. Um, and I guess, Tomas, maybe you could share a little bit more about like how you are really gauging that activity. Is it simply like volume or is it, you know, number of daily active users or... Like from the Kraken side, like how do you quantify or, or maybe even qualify what like indicates um, interest in, in the space again? Sure. So it's broad based. Uh, everything from sign up activity to volume to monthly transacting users. 
Uh, we try to look at different levels of monthly transacting users by different products or experiences. So for example, uh, we've seen record activity in our consumer experience. We've seen very strong activity in the spot exchange, margin trading, futures, OTC desk. And I think it's the combination of, of course, pickup and market activity, but also crack in uh, doing marketing really for the first time in 2023. Historically, it's been very word of mouth. And so uh, it's a broad based kind of look. Uh, liquidity as well has been picking up. But, um, but that's kind of how we think about it internally. And as far as the external market, how we think about uh, crypto in general, you know, each of these halving cycles brings in a ton of new people into the industry. Uh, you're talking millions, tens of millions, maybe even hundreds of millions of people. And right now, about less than 9% of the global population has touched crypto in some way, shape or form. And once you start to see uh, crypto hit, call it mid-teens penetration, you typically see in, in technological adoption uh, a pretty steep acceleration. And so the question on our end really is, does this halving cycle in action bring us to that tipping point? I, I have a strong conviction that it might. And from there, you know, who knows, maybe the super cycle becomes a real thing. And, it, and it's not just a real thing, but a really, really crazy experience. Dude, I have not heard the word super cycle in so long. That's honestly crazy to hear in, in a space is like, wow, that that's wild. Um, and I mean, maybe uh, Dylan, if you could offer a little context here um, on how you're kind of reading the market. I mean, obviously, like we love to say Bitcoin breaks models, um, but perhaps there's, you know, something that you're looking at as far as I know, like market cap to realize cap um, is, is something you're keeping an eye on. But Maybe you can just share like a, a temperature check on like, you know, the state of the market and maybe how it compared to your expectations um, prior to like the ETF approvals. Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, I will 100% say, I mean, definitively, I did not expect highs uh, early this year, uh, new all-time highs. So I've been pleasantly surprised. Um, and the ETFs, and I've said this too, uh, completely shattered expectations from the start. I, I mean, I think on a long time frame, it was... Yeah, it was obvious that this was a great event driven driven trade and event, you know, just like a event in the Bitcoin's monetization path. But I thought, I mean, and wrongly thought that it would be more of a a driver in terms of narrative and the Wall Street acceptance rather than just a pure, you know, indiscriminate amount of flows um, that we've seen. Even you know, even with the GPT selling um, or the draining of GPTC that we've seen, you know, the fact that Fidelity and BlackRock have had just you know, every single day uh, is inflows, no outflows. Um, and, you know, iBit's the most successful ETF of all time from launch is, you know, a, a pleasant surprise. Um, and I think that was after a couple of weeks of, you know, just indiscriminate inflows, it was clear that, okay, wow, this is surpassing all expectations. And Bitcoin was still hanging around 40, 50K. So um, I think at that point it was clear. But if you said at the start of the year, you know, we hit 70,000 um, in, in March or so, I would have, I, I don't know if I would have believed you. Um, so shout out to everyone that was was crazy, crazy, uh, way bullish because um, they were, you know, vindicated in that sense. Um, but I kind of from the da data standpoint, what I'm seeing is, you know, pretty similar to most bull cycles. Uh, bull cycles are primed by record amount of, of hodlers and, and accumulation. Um, and just, you, you know, just the raw data alone, we saw it, and you, know, you could look at a simple metric like how much Bitcoin hasn't moved in a year. Um, which was at an all-time high of like 70% or so. Um, so the supply side, we, I mean, that was primed through the latter half of 2022 and all of 23. Um, that was the catalyst. And all you need are some, you know, some interested buyers. Uh, and, you know, Bitcoin's very much supply and elastic and it, it rips. And so we've seen that and now we're starting to see, you know, the early stages of distribution of coins uh, to new entrants. And that's, you know, that's not like like hodlers are definitively selling a, a bit, not their whole stack. But this happens every cycle, right? Um, you know, if this didn't happen, if all of the early miners and Silk Road uh, <laughs> transactors never parted ways with any of their coins, uh, we wouldn't be where we are today. The same thing goes for the 2013 cycle, the 2017 cycle, the 2021 cycle. Like 
we purged all the you know the inefficient miners. We purged all of the yield farms and hedge funds and market makers and Ponzi's. And so now we're in, in this phase where you know the people that caught knives for you know two three years um, are at right now. I mean, I'm not uh, I'm not parting ways with any of my my coin right now, but. Um, I mean that we're in the early stages of the distribution, and I, from from what the data says, it's or at least you know historical analogs. It's not not a guarantee uh, for future performance, but yeah, we got about you know twelve twelve months um, before things get really really crazy. And you know while we've seen the distribution, I, I wouldn't say we're at all in a blow off top mania phase um, in the derivative market compared to previous highs. Um, looks pretty healthy. Uh, a lot of a lot of USD margin, a lot of USD collateral, stablecoin collateral, and CME, uh, which is you know treasuries and dollars, rather than you know crypto native Bitcoin, Ethereum collateral in the system. Um, you know, and with FTX, you had Solana shitcoins, and yeah, you know, there were FTT token as collateral, and anything was accepted. So, just the makeup of where we are in the market, you know, despite being at you know flirting with all time highs, is very different. Um, and from, you know, the effects of the halving, I, I will have this to say, and I've said it a few different times. I said it, um, I think a couple spaces here and maybe, um, as well as my, I put out a kind of an episode on the, my thoughts on the halving. Um, but I think it's more of a demand event than it is a supply event. And that, you know, everybody, and that maybe doesn't make much sense. So bear with me, but you know, everybody quotes, you know, the, the halving and the supply shock that happens. But I think at this phase, if you just look at the, the coins that, you know, you can look at spot volumes, but I on, on exchanges and ETFs. But a, a lot of that is kind of you know not net buying or selling. It's a lot of you know market makers who are who are not wash trading, but you know buying and selling multiple times throughout the day. Um, but also, just if you look at like the coins changing hands, the UTXO set on a daily basis, or you know the the distribution and accumulation from you know these kind of really convicted long term hodlers, it's to the tunes of you know. Ten, the f thousands, tens of thousands of Bitcoin a day um, that are kind of washing through the system, going to exchanges, being pulled out. You know, odd, old holders are distributing. Like it was, I think the last thirty days was around a hundred thousand Bitcoin to new to new addresses. You know, coins that were dormant for a long time. So the 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 flip from or the change from nine hundred BTC a day of issuance to four hundred fifty a day. I mean, it's certainly significant, and it all it of course matters at the margin. But I think when I say it's a demand event, I think it's more so that there's an entire world out there that that has heard about Bitcoin, right? 99% of the world has probably heard of Bitcoin before, but a, a whole lot of that, uh, you know, the global population doesn't deeply understand it. And probably even the people in finance couldn't intimately describe or articulate the mechanics of the having, the mechanics of why, how 21 million is enforced mechanics of proof of work mining, the difficulty adjustment, like kind of these fundamentals, these staples of what makes Bitcoin Bitcoin. Um, so this having in the uh, in the face of, you know, Biden bumbling about rate cuts and, you know, reacceleration of inflation and the Fed, you know, probably cutting this year into that accelerating inflation um, and this fiscal situation, that's the worst we've ever seen. Um, with with you know higher rates accelerating this massive debt Ponzi spiral we're in, I, I think it's just this massive media event, um, and obviously we're playing a part of it, right? Like the Kraken Bitcoin Magazine is having a, a live stream, and we're going to be you know shouting to the world about how important this is. But you know a lot of people are going to be looking at their screen saying the Bitcoin having like what's that? Or I remember that in 2020. What did it do again? And or what did it do the last three times? Um, and whether correlation, causation, you know, whether it's just, you know, dumb luck that Bitcoin goes parabolic after the halvings and, you know, it has more to do with dollar liquidity. Um, I mean, we can have like long debates about that and certain people have stronger opinions each way. Um, but I think it's just this massive signal that, you know, a political programmatic monetary policy is superior. Um, so I think it's a demand event, um, which is, again, kind of kind of odd, but that's my, my thoughts in general around the halving. Yeah, and on that note, Tomas, maybe you could speak to, um, like, OTC volumes um, at Kraken. Like, what does that demand picture look like um, on the OTC desk side? I'm, I'm not sure if that's, you know, something you're, you're willing to share, um, but I'd be really curious, like, how that demand picture is looking on, on y'all's end, because I think that's, um, like, those, those larger pools of capital 
are you know, obviously becoming increasingly important as Bitcoin's market cap goes up, um, but also just in terms of the narrative that's that is prevalent right now is like more of this institutional or or you know um, family office side of things really coming to the fore. Yeah, of course. So I I can't share like specific numbers, but I'll kind of give you rough context here. Um, I think uh, OTC, our OTC desk, of course, serves high net worth, more institutions, just in terms of the the business itself. Uh, so, for example, you know, we offer things like automated RFQs and some exotic products like OTC options and whatnot, um, more discretion, execution methods and things like that. And I think a lot of the pickup in the business started around 2020. You had COVID, a lot of the early signs of inflation with money printing and folks like uh, Paul Tudor Jones and uh, of course, like Larry Fink and whatnot, starting to signal that assets and commodities, uh, particularly assets like Bitcoin, might be sort of that, that winning horse in the context of, of broader inflation. And I would say more recently, some of the institutional interest you're seeing is coming from multiple places. One, um, you had an acceleration of regulatory scrutiny and harder regulatory compliance over the last year and a half since the FTX implosion um, and, and the fraud associated with it. You've had the ongoing inflation scare. Uh, you have the idea that rate cuts lead to risk on behavior. And then, of course, seeing ongoing validation from folks like Larry Fink, who had a very strong change of mind on Bitcoin in general and his participation in it. And, and so that leads to this kind of momentum around institutions coming in. So as far as our OTC desk is concerned, you know, we're seeing a lot of activity in terms of clients onboarded who are interested in the service. We're seeing a lot of clients who are starting to place trades and get exposure to this asset class in general, whether it's Bitcoin or other assets like Ethereum. And I think uh, it just speaks to that kind of broader opening of interest in trying to get exposure because at the end of the day, whether you're an institution that serves end clients like an asset manager or you're an institution like perhaps a hedge fund or someone that trades on their own principle, uh, you kind of feel like you need to have exposure into this momentum-driven uh, occasion. So on the OTC side, you're seeing definitely a lot of interest. And one other comment I'll make, Bitcoin as an asset class and what institutions are starting to recognize is I think this is the most symbolic having you'll ever have in, in Bitcoin, uh, even looking into the future, because you have such a strong narrative, you know, by April, 94% of all Bitcoins that are ever mined uh, will have been mined by that point. You also have inflation in the Bitcoin supply falling below 1%. And so this starts to create like really strong story points and pitches for these kinds of players to get into the space. And when you think about the price action, I don't think people recognize this. I think folks like Arthur Hayes, who's calling for a million dollar Bitcoin, do recognize this. But there is no asset in the world that has the, the kind of broad participation um, of a population globally. So we're talking about hundreds of millions of people that have owned or touched this asset class. And when you think about the supply shock, I mean, Dylan was was referring to this earlier, but there aren't new Bitcoins in a meaningful way coming into the into the space through mining. And so it really becomes a secondary market transaction. You're buying Bitcoin from people who hold it today. And um, when you think about liquidity in the Bitcoin markets, uh, Kraken, of course, being one of the leading venues on that side, it's really only like tens of millions of dollars in the within 1% of the midpoint price or the live price. And so when you see institutions, particularly with the OTC desk, they're looking for services that sort of pace out the execution. You know, they're not throwing in market buys for five, ten million million. They're trying to build position over days, months, um, call it. And so you're seeing constant buying pressure supporting the price level. And on top of that, you have that action for more of the consumer audience who are coming in and, and ramping that up. And so that's where you start to see the price levels really jack up. And again, no other asset class has the kind of characteristics that you have with 
Bitcoin in terms of supply and whatnot. And so you could see really stupid activity when it comes from a price level perspective. Uh, some people might look down upon that, but I think longer term, uh, it's going to really set the trend for what the price could look like with Bitcoin in general. Yeah, and I, I think the point that you make about Bitcoin's, you know, annual percentage inflation going below that of the average of gold over time is like such a significant narrative for folks that are operating in these like much deeper markets traditionally. Like this is something that they're like, they can really look to as like a, a comp that actually has like tangible real world implications. Um, and I think that that's like incredibly significant just from a narrative standpoint. Um, but it is really interesting to hear you say um, really how little liquidity is available to these folks that are trying to make these larger market buys. Um, and really also just shows like how unique the Bitcoin market is in that respect. Like it doesn't take much to drive Bitcoin up like the, the multiplier um, on, on those dollars that enter um, really does have such a large effect. And, and I think that what you said um, highlights that point of view pretty well. I have uh, this is a bit of a, a side point here, um, but I just wanted to get this out here in case we don't touch on it. Um, and not that it's a, a little late, but, um, you know, for anyone out here that, that transacts with on-chain Bitcoin, um, you know, which everybody should, you should have cold storage. And if you use Bitcoin on a daily basis, even better. Um, you know, I don't imagine maybe, you know, maybe there's many uh, lightning node runners in the audience. Uh, but just, you know, if you have, uh, you know, a bunch of Bitcoin and cold storage or you've been sending, you know, automated purchases to cold storage um, and you haven't thought of, of UTXO management of, you know, how your Bitcoin is, you know, held for the long term. Um, you know, you should really think about this going into the halving, um, at least because on the interim basis, and I have, you know, I don't really have a strong opinion on a long term effect here. Um, but I mean, f fees are already uh, 100 sats per V-byte, um, you know, about 10, 12 bucks a transaction, um, you know, depending on on how big it is and how many UTXOs, but, um, you know, after the halving there, and not even to get into the specifics, I mean, this isn't an endorsement or not of, of what's what's happening, but there's going to be on the halving a launch of a new token gambling meta protocol, and I, from what I understand, fees are going to be probably, I would, I would guess, and this is an estimate, this is a guess, but probably 10x higher than they are today. Um, so, you know, if you want to immediately settle Bitcoin or you have to close Lightning channels or you want to consolidate a bunch of your old Bitcoin transactions into one, um, because if you, for instance, if you send a daily Bitcoin transaction to a new address or just to your cold storage, well, those aren't, you know, those are all different UTXOs. And not to get technical, but I think a, a lot of people in the past couple of years have onboarded to Bitcoin. They've taken the step to self-custody, which is fantastic, which is great, and we should commend that. Um, but that, you know, the next level is kind of understanding, um, you know, how costly and how much weight these future transactions are going to have in this very, very valuable, increasingly valuable commodity that is block space. Um, so there's going to be an explosion of interest in Bitcoin's block space uh, over the next epoch. And that wasn't true of last epoch in 2022 and for periods of time throughout even 20, 2020, 2021 and 2023. There were, you know, lulls in, in the mempool. There were lulls in Bitcoin transactions where you could basically settle for almost no cost on chain. And, you know, a lot of this explosion, the explosion of this speculative activity, like it or not, and there's this kind of, you know, real, <laughs> this, this debate that kind of goes, jumps the shark on the technical side of things and ignores the actual, <laughs> the actual technical implementation of this or, you know, the technical implementation of, of, cutting this out and starts to get into morals and, you know, philosophical jibber jabber um, without just kind of understanding that this is here and this is a reality. Um, so given that this is a reality in a world where Bitcoin transactions cost you on chain cost you $50 for, or a hundred dollars for a period of time. And I don't think it'll be like that forever. I think the mempool will clear because there's an economic incentive to do so. Miners, mining transactions, but all this to say, you shouldn't be caught off guard if, for a period of time after the having, or just at any point in the next few years, Bitcoin on-chain settlement is an extremely valuable 
commodity. Um, and, you know, there's all sorts of potential L2s and bridges and things that are being tried, and a lot of them will fail, and a lot of them will be dumb, and a lot of them will crash, and the tokens are pure gambling, and they, the people don't pretend that these have a use case. But the miners will mine them, and that's just, if you, if you don't think they will, then I guess you're, you're kind of ignoring the, the reality of the situation these days. So, all that to say, if you have cold storage Bitcoin, if you have lightning nodes, if you have any of this stuff, and you have neglected that until now, and right now fees are pretty, <laughs> pretty pricey, um, but I think they're going to be a whole lot pricier in about nine days or so. So, uh, just a note um, to anyone out there, um, I just wanted to get that in before we you know, jump around to a different topic. Yeah, I think that's, yeah, it, it definitely seems like that's going to be the case. Um, fees on the base chain, um, it seems like there's no doubt that they're going to go much higher from here. Uh, it's a great point. Thank you for uh, thank you for sharing that, Dylan. Um, I wanted to go back to something Thomas you were saying, or Tomas, you were saying about, um, you know, about, you know, there's we have the supply shock with Bitcoin. Maybe some people aren't bullish enough. We could see the price rise much higher than most expect. Um, given that Kraken is an exchange with other assets on it, you, you'll see, you see also not only that people are buying Bitcoin, but what other people are buying as well. And I remember looking at some statistics uh, from the last cycle. Um, I think I was looking at something like might have been Coinbase where, you know, in the beginning of the cycle, you have a lot of people buying Bitcoin and then they sort of go out on the risk curve, buy whatever shit coins, blah, blah, blah. Um, do you think that unit bias is going to be an issue in this cycle? Let's say we do see Bitcoin to like 150, 200, 250. Do you just do you think that there might be an issue with a lot of people just saying, hey, I missed it, not really knowing the difference between Bitcoin and other digital assets and just saying uh, this other one over here is a lot cheaper than Bitcoin per unit. I'm just going to buy that one instead. I think it depends. So a lot of times when you saw dominance fall, on Bitcoin in general, it coincides with some kind of event. Um, like, for example, you had DeFi Summer kicking a lot of interest into altcoins, um, into Ethereum in particular. And and so, of course, dominance fell there. And then when NFTs started um, just really ripping, you saw Bitcoin dominance fall again. When Bitcoin dominance does really well, it's when you have these, it's like, I call it density of follow on all time highs. So, you see all-time highs being hit, uh, call it five times a month, 10 times a month. And that's where you have a very strong level of Bitcoin dominance. Um, when it comes to like risk behavior in general, again, like I think a lot of it's driven by events. So to the extent you see speculation around the Ethereum ETF um, and that, that event's coming up in the next month and a half or so, that of course might drive some of the, the shift in terms of trading activity. Um, if you were to see... What, what I'm expecting is maturation of the last venture capital cycle. So tens of billions of dollars that went into a lot of different applications and companies in 2021. So things like GameFi, uh, more DeFi protocols or applications and whatnot. These are kind of like dark horses. You don't know when they start to take up. You don't know when people start to really adopt them and momentum kicks up. But that's when you start seeing dominance again fall and people shifting their activity towards the, the cool trendy thing at that time. So hard to say or call that the having event in specifically has this impact. Um, I think we've seen it in the past again because of this density of all-time highs that just coincide uh, several months after the having. And so, uh, but, but again, if you have these kinds of events come up, You'll see quick shifts in this in the, the trend of activity in general. Yeah, on that topic of Bitcoin dominance, um, I know I see like the ETH BTC chart is hovering around 0.05, um, and it has been for I think a few weeks now. And um, you know we've also just seen Bitcoin dominance continue to creep up. Um, Tomas, I'm wondering if you have a take on where Bitcoin dominance might go. And I think like from from the Bitcoin perspective. Um, I think as Dylan articulated, there's a lot of um, use of alternatives to Bitcoin in prior cycles that were, you know, done for things like meme coins or um, now we have ordinals coming to Bitcoin. I'm just curious, like, how you see that market evolving um, and maybe if you have a perspective on where Bitcoin dominance may go um, into the having and post. Sure. So on the topic of meme coins, I know this gets perhaps a disproportionate share of attention. Uh, from the media side, and not that that's a bad thing or improper, but when it comes to the data, 
itself. If you think about stuff like volume outside of trading activity of the main coins, uh, so any particular use case built around it, uh, or volume itself on DEXs and whatnot, um, market capitalization of those assets. I mean, they're they're very low single digit versus the broader crypto market. So I think people uh, assume that they're really taking over the market, but that's not the case. It's it's more taking over the attention. Uh, in terms of like broader Bitcoin dominance, uh, again, it kind of ebbs and flows around the catalyst that I was mentioning historically, but it's been consistently averaging, call it around 50% since you started seeing maturation uh, around the ICO boom in Ethereum specifically. And so I, I don't have any reason to believe that Bitcoin, which has built a really strong narrative around sound money, uh, around the concept of strong collateral, I don't see a reason to believe that there's going to be a competitor to that. I see reasons to believe that alternative chains that are more uh, EVM focused or application focused, uh, you, you have just varying degrees of demand over them. And perhaps longer term, much like you had the, the growth in services and social media and stuff like that built on the internet that just created massive value, perhaps you have this downtrend in the value of sound money versus the value of applications built on some of these crypto assets and networks. But I don't, I don't really think that there's going to be like a very short term pop in either direction. Yeah, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll chime in here. Um, I mean, I, I think it's maybe Bitcoin, something like Bitcoin dominance is okay for looking at the trend of Bitcoin's market cap relative to the broader crypto complex. But I think in terms of like an absolute number when someone's like, well, it's 46% or 65 or whatever the number is, it's kind of misses the point because... The, the I mean Bitcoin itself is ex extremely illiquid, right? You put a you put a couple billion dollars on the spot bid for Bitcoin, pumps the market cap. I mean people have guesstimates or whatnot, but it, it pumps the market cap by tens of billions at least, right? Like it, there's it's not one to one. You put a dollar put a dollar in on the buy side or sell side, and the market cap goes up. So Bitcoin itself is inelastic, and all of the other cryptos are much much more inelastic, right? Like for instance, a lot of these meme coins, and I do agree that it gra it does grab a lot of the media headlines and, you know, the attention economy of crypto Twitter, right, whatever is that kind of the newest flash in the pan. Um, but to say, you know, the the fifth best or latest dog token is is truly a billion dollars equivalent to, you know, a public company or, or something similar is, I think, just kind of, not naive, but it's just the wrong framing, right? Like, we can, if we look at, like, all the Bitcoin where they moved, at the price it last moved, we get an actually like a pretty good sense of like the total amount of money or how much this thing's actually changed hands. What's it worth? And we, you know, we can do that with Ethereum, and we could do that with some of the other alts. But if you looked at that, I would, I would almost guarantee that a lot of these other chains, coins, memes, DeFi, whatever it is, um, it's not actually as <laughs> as large of a you know quote market cap as you would say uh, or think. So I think that's that's you know point one and point two is I have no directional uh, I mean I'm not putting on a short ETH BTC trade like I think getting cute like that is is, is not relevant but um, from someone that's watched from the you know watched the broader crypto ecosystem um, and been been you know I would say a self-proclaimed Bitcoin maximalist at this point um, and through the years. I think it is interesting that, you know, while ETH and the EVM has had a really strong network effect, um, blockchains don't scale infinitely. And so there's obviously been a need for, you know, these L2s, right? And then they all have throughput problems. And I mean, Bitcoin itself has had, has a, has had a bunch of conversation about, you know, block space and throughput and fees and scaling, right? And so with that, I think, you know, part of the reason that, the, you know, meme coins, particularly on something like a Solana, has been so popular is because there was kind of this, this, like, it was kind of pretend for a while that, like, a lot of people were, like, in it for the tech, right? Or, like, oh, this, you know, this DeFi protocol is actually, you know, genuinely innovative and has, like, this massive moat and network effect that will last for decades and has earnings. And, and I think really what it was, like, people just want to speculate on, directionally on token prices, 
And so, like, the latest meme coins has been kind of funny because and I honestly, like, you know, somewhat appreciate the, the pure honesty of, like, no, this coin literally does nothing. Um, and that's the point. And that's why it's, you know, we're bidding it to a billion dollars or whatever. Um, and, you know, something like Ethereum is kind of being flanked by both, like, the all of the hot money, a lot of the new users, a lot of the, the speculative hot ball of money is going to something like a Solana, and at the same time is being flanked by Bitcoin, which is, you know, immutable, sound, absolutely scarce money. We, I mean, we know that, right? And Ethereum kind of had to play both worlds, right? They're like, well, we're a world computer, dApps, whatever, you know, whatever the DeFi, whatever the kind of the narrative is, we're this Turing complete virtual machine. But no, we're also, you know, we're also ultrasound money, right? And it kind of tried to hyper optimize for, for two things. And, you know, we're decentralized and, you know, it's, and, and I would say, you know, Ethereum is directionally like, or on the spectrum is, is more decentralized than a Solana, is more decentralized than, you know, XYZ coin. But I think what, 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 at least personally from what I've learned the last year, that like Bitcoin is nuclear grade tech and we've known that and like to, to actually overthrow hundreds of trillions of dollars of fiat currency interest, you need to have you know, nuclear grade decentralization, and maybe it's not even decentralized enough, right? We're still, we're still living and this is still an experiment. But for, for the other crypto chains, I think like people have pretended to care about decentralization, right? But really it's just like, what's the best casino? Um, and, and not to be like nihilistic, but I think a lot, of the, a lot of the crypto complex has been, you know, kind of masquerading as like, well, no, this is like, this is like the, the best tech, right? And, and really more so, it's just a global casino. And obviously, I mean, as evidenced by FanDuel, DraftKings, and USA Gambling, and just global, global gambling, there, there's a demand for PVP speculation, no doubt. Um, but I think, I mean, every cycle we, I think people kind of come to believe that these games aren't zero-sum. Like, oh, like, you know, this, uh, the eighth dog token isn't a zero-sum game. These are all positive sum, and then, you know, this virtuous cycle that never ends until it does. Um, and, you know, everyone finds out that these are zero-sum games. And I would say, you know, my assumption is that Bitcoin, you could say the same thing about Bitcoin, right? Or at least some people might say that. And I would say the monetization of Bitcoin is not zero-sum, it's positive sum. The monetization of a new money from scratch is, is zero, is not a zero-sum game, it's positive sum. And the rest of these, uh, a lot of the tokens are kind of competing whether they know it or not, or whether they are, you know, directly saying it or not, are competing with monetary attributes. So I think it's been interesting that, um, you know, Bitcoin's now has a few new things, right? There's like this ordinal speculative complex. There's there's a whole bunch of L2s that may or may not be, quote unquote, you know, L2s that are coming um, that might enable a lot of this, you know, DeFi um, activity on second layers. Might a lot allow kind of the, some of the stuff that you saw on Ethereum with Bitcoin with varying trust assumptions. So, I mean, I'm excited to see it all play out. Um, and, you know, I'm obviously super bullish on Bitcoin. And I think, interestingly, a lot of people in crypto have been underweight Bitcoin, the asset, because it's been a dumb rock for so long, right? Like that's, can't do anything. All you can do is send, receive, hold, you know, screw you guys, you know, screw the, the laser eyes. They're just grumpy old boomers. We're going to go have fun. And that's fine, right? Like I, I get it. Um, but... It's interesting that Bitcoin is starting, and who knows, maybe it comes to fruition, maybe it doesn't. Um, you know, maybe you trust the trust assumptions, maybe you don't. But a lot of that stuff is coming either directly to Bitcoin or on varying layers um, will kind of be, you know, will enable some of that stuff. So I'm really interested to see it play out, and I'm also interested to see how the rest of kind of crypto um, trades relative to that um, on, a, on a longer time frame. I think it's we're in a really interesting spot here. So sorry for the rant, but I think it's a it's a fun fun time to be in Bitcoin. Let me add really quickly on this, or perhaps not really quickly, but um, the the concept of people coming into the space for speculation and whatnot. So you have well, well one. Let me preface this: it's true. You know, there's market research to suggest that something on the order of like 50% plus of people, at least in developed countries, are interested in crypto because it's a wealth generating opportunity. For people who, uh, even in developed countries that are lower income, but also developing countries, there's interesting use cases beyond just speculation uh, that they're turning to because it's an improvement on some of the financial infrastructure they have locally. 
there's, I think, a negative perception around this, uh, especially when you talk to people in TradFi, uh, some of the regulators perhaps as well, that because crypto has a lot of speculative activity, that that's a negative thing. I think people associate speculation with something negative, but look at the stock market, for example. Like, There's nothing holier about people speculating uh, and trying to make money off of buying a stock. It's just a different asset class. Uh, at the end of the day, look at NVIDIA stock. You know, As far as fundamentals on earnings and whatnot, I mean, you could make the, a strong argument for the stock price outpacing any of that. And so is NVIDIA holier than some token on Ethereum? I don't personally think so. Uh, what I think is more important is this concept that for a lot of early technologies, speculation is usually the early stage of it. You're talking about early adopters who are taking significant risks, putting money to work. And so they do deserve a return in my opinion. So look at AI as an analogy. You have the launch of GPT through chat GPT. People go crazy about it. You have this flood of money going into AI, crazy valuations. And what is that doing? It's accelerating the pace of development in what is otherwise a really valuable technology. And if you look at even crypto, so let's talk about DeFi, for example, you had this crazy speculation around DeFi tokens, but look at what happened when FTX blew up. I mean, a lot of these DeFi players didn't blow up. I mean, they, they were, functionally speaking. And so I, I do think that speculation is, of course, inherently part of the crypto space, but the negative perception around it, I think is, or the negative stigma around it, I think is something that we're going to have to just deal with and talk through. And I, I don't think it's a negative uh, problem or, or a negative attribute of crypto in general. It's just part of an early technology. The more important thing is, does the technology work? Bitcoin, it works. Ethereum, it works. The tokens on Ethereum, it works. Whatever these tokens are designed for are ultimately speaking, in most cases, functioning as, as they're intended to. And on, on that note of like speculation and the stigma around it, I almost think that it ties back to like the overarching macro picture of people think that investing in an index fund is saving and not a form of speculation. And I think that that's like almost tried to distance itself as from what it truly is. And I think people don't really understand like the inherent uncertainties of dealing with markets. Um, I mean, I, if you ask professionals, I'm sure they would you know be able to understand this concept, but like. From a public perception perspective, I think that people don't even really understand what it means to speculate in the first place. Is you know, it's kind of like there's these fish that have been swimming in, in speculative water their whole lives, and they don't even realize it. Um, and I, I kind of say this just to kind of open the door back up to to the macro picture that we're we're living through right now. Um, and Tomas, I know um, you may have uh, a hard stop, so please let us know if you got a bounce. Um, but I'd love to just, just touch on that macro piece um, before we wrap things up. Yeah, sure. So, I mean, ultimately speaking, everything that Kraken's doing, everything that I believe in personally is about this macro picture. And so when we think about strategy at Kraken, for example, like we're doing this in the context of five, 10 year horizons, uh, like the Kraken's going to live until then and beyond. Like that's our goal. And, and of course, our mission is to get crypto in the hands of people, accelerate adoption so they can achieve financial freedom. It's really important to us. But on the topic of adoption, I, I mentioned earlier, less than 10% of the population so far has touched crypto in some way, shape or form. And crypto is an asset class, is a technology built on the internet, which has massive global penetration, you know, talking 60% plus of the, of the global population but within developing countries, like this is 95% plus oftentimes. And, um, and we're still like super early stage. So I like to think of crypto adoption in the context of uh, some analogous technologies. So let's think about the internet adoption curve and social media adoption curve. I, I use these as sort of the boundary conditions. Um, crypto is a technology built on the internet. It doesn't require you to rip up streets, lay down uh, connection lines. It doesn't require you to lay down undersea cables uh, and whatnot and backbones. It's a very infrastructure light technology. And so in that context, I believe crypto 
the adoption trend of crypto is going to outpace what you saw with the internet. However, when you think about the adoption trend of social media, uh, this was also an infrastructure-like technology. People just have to download an app or sign up for an account. But think about the use case around social media. You know, at first it was about talking to your friends, then it became uh, sharing pictures, sharing experiences, and that's trended differently over time. But ultimately speaking, like these activities are safe activities. Like you're not going to uh, put at risk your financial well-being or livelihood uh, by transacting in these activities. They're free. And, and they're also applications that are familiar to you. I have always shared pictures with my friends and family. The question is, do I do it over social media or did I do it in person with physical photos? And so these are familiar to people. They're more likely to more quickly adopt it. So let's call that the boundary condition. Faster than internet adoption, slower than social media adoption. And so when I plot that, I pretend that they all start, they all began as a technology back in January 2009 when the first Bitcoin block was mined. And if you think or look forward to 2030 and use those as the boundary conditions, you start to believe that Bitcoin crypto falls in the hands of like 25% of the global population, perhaps upwards to 75% if you believe strongly in the trends of internet adoption and whatnot as well. And in that context, like you're talking about, call it 500 million billion and a half people that might come into the industry in the next three to five years. That's why I call it the super cycle, because if you have this kind of pace of adoption, you're talking about entering that tipping point within this epoch of the uh, Bitcoin halving cycle. And so that's when things just really take off. And it's so exponential that you can't think about what the peak looks like. It's just not something that our minds, I think, are capable of in the context of linear thinking and whatnot. So that's what I look at when it comes to adoption, long-term thinking with crypto and Kraken. And I can also stay on a little bit longer. Yeah, awesome. Thanks for that. I think that like that approach of trying to set boundary conditions of um, the internet versus social media and uh, like crypto networks falling somewhere in between um, makes a lot of sense. Um, and I think that the really big question mark in my head is the environments in which these networks uh, exist in is, I guess, different than those other two, given that it is um, financial. Um, and so, Dylan, I know you mentioned previously, uh, you know, Biden making comments about the Federal Reserve. And um, I think it really just highlights the lack of independence of the Federal Reserve. If that was even a question, it certainly was not for me. Um, but maybe you can talk about for like the, you know, mid to short term, um, kind of the, the debt situation. And, and I know you spoke about ex reaccelerating inflation. Um, do you have any, any context you could share with us on what that picture is looking like to you at the moment? Yeah, sure. Um, well, I mean, I will say I, in the context of this tightening cycle, I, I thought that they would let it get a bit uglier than they did. I thought that we would see, you know, somewhat of, of, of a, you know, kind of a traditional cleanse, I guess, and we did in some sorts, we had a massive treasury bear market. And, um, but, you know, the, this traditional stuff like the employment cycle turning and, you know, kind of det deterioration of credit and, you know, something you'd see in a kind of a traditional Keynesian business cycle was, you know, that kind of uh, cleanse and rebirth in, in, you know, in hindsight was obviously stunted by a fiscal deficit spending at a pace that we, you know, the U.S. has never seen outside of wartime or recessions, um, like like real recessions, not just asset price um, declines, um, and that's been sustained. And so, you know, after a decade of zero percent interest rates, I mean, because if you think of the longer picture, and you know, if you go back before COVID, the debt was at an unsustainable level, even you know, one hundred percent debt to GDP. And they were having talks of like, how do we reduce this, this, these global debt burdens? And, you know, academics and IMF and central banks were like, well, you need, you need a sustained period of inflation. You need to let inflation rip, keep interest rates pinned, you erode the debt. Well, they did that. They got the inflation. Like all the Fed speakers were asking, were literally begging for high levels of inflation in the later phase of 22, uh, 2020. They got it, but it was so politically, 
you know, it was not it was not acceptable on a political standpoint. You know, right, left, all blaming Powell, blaming the Fed. You need to get down inflation or get down the rate of change of inflation, rather. Um, so they hiked. They hiked to five, five and a half percent, fastest t- tightening cycle in history. Um, and so inflation has come down. The rate of change has come down. The absolute level of price and prices hasn't. But the pace that they've ran this fiscal, but this fiscal deficit has made it so the debt in, in productivity terms hasn't declined at all. So we had the, the once in 50 year inflation burst and debt didn't go anywhere. In nominal terms, debt went up only and in you know, relative to productivity, debt went sideways, debt levels. So we're still, we still have a decade of, net by, by, unless you believe, you know, some people like uh, Spencer Schiff believe we are in for a productivity boom brought about by AI that we have never seen before in human history. Um, and, and, you know, maybe that is, uh, <laughs> maybe you think that, um, which is fine. Um, but outside of that, you need a period of, of sustained high inflation above interest rates globally to get these debt levels to sustainable, um, you know, to a sustainable place. Otherwise, you know, we're just going to be in a place where we have high inflation forever and the Fed's going to pin rates. And so in that scenario, creditors and savers get absolutely screwed. And by creditors, I mean bondholders, people that hold debt instruments. So, I mean, this is a, this is a couple hundred trillion dollars in question. Um, and there's not that many vehicles to escape that or insulate yourself from that. So I think that's like the pillar of my Bitcoin thesis is that, you know, this global fixed income market, even with the, you know, move from 1% to 5%, and, you know, 4% and change on, you know, 30-year U.S. treasuries, there's still this massive cost of capital question of, are you really interested in buying long-term government debt that pays you a 4% interest rate in fiat terms? Um, who's interested in that? I'm certainly not. Hell no. You know, you know, maybe you buy it for a quick trade, but who's lending money for 30 years, right? Like, you're going to get all your money back. It's not like, you know, they're going to, they're not explicitly defaulting. But implicitly, they're defaulting because the, the dollar, the euro, the yen, they're, it's all going to be worth, you know, worth less or worth a lot less. So I think that's where, you know, that's the, that's why Bitcoin at a, a, a trillion and a half is still massively mispriced. It's, well, there's no, there's no one, not one political leader, there's not the red team, the blue team, there's not one person out there with a, a strategy or plan or solution to get us out of this. I mean, words, words are words, but actions... Um, actions are what matter, and, and there's no one coming to save us. So, you know, and this is not just the U.S. I'm talking U.S. here, but this is not U.S. centric. This is global. So, I think that's where it's really, really exciting. Bitcoin's still very nascent in terms of global liquidity, um, and you know, the the opportunity for Bitcoin, but also Bitcoin in debt markets as a form of collateral. By the way, people still haven't figured out that that Bitcoin 24/7, 365 liquidity in every jurisdiction on the planet with non-stop trading uh, is when implemented correctly, a zero default model. Um, no one's fig- uh, not no one's figured it out, but interest rates on those products, for instance, like Unchained's product has had zero defaults ever. In six, six seven years, it has had zero defaults. There's been zero defaults for creditors, right? Meaning because it's over collateralized. So, but that product right now is like a 15, 16% interest rate to no fault of Unchained's to the people that on the, the credit side have to fund these sort of products. And in theory, right, if you have a no-loss credit instrument, that should be, you know, priced similar to like what, you know, a Goldman private wealth client would get when they margin their S&P 500 stock at Fed funds plus, you know, 50 bips. So I think that that's the real, you know, the Bitcoin story, the debt story, but also this massive fixed income complex that is all built on a centrally planned cost of capital that has to be repressed. Um, and it's, it's not a widely understood story, right? Like most people think that, you know, stocks are going up or, you know, because, because, or housing is going up only because it's good investments and it's really just a currency devaluation and shockingly, you know, maybe the investor class is starting to understand, but Bitcoin's still pretty damn cheap at $70,000. And that sounds weird to say, but I think a lot, a lot of people would do well to internalize that. Can I, uh, can I ask a, could I jump in and ask a quick question? Is that all right, Spencer? Cool. Yeah, cool. absolutely. Just a quick follow-up question, Dylan. Um, thank you for that overview. Um, Luke Roman has talked a lot about 
other countries that have had to hyperinflate through the bond market. I think he cited Israel having done this. And he says sort of this period of hyperinflation lasts for however many years. And then things sort of, uh, you know, homeostasis is sort of found again. Um, with everything you just touched on, do you think that a thesis like that or a perspective on that, something like that is possible where we will see something where, you know, we do see hyperinflation in the fixed income market, but that it eventually subsides. And what does it look like on the other side, if that could be the case? Yeah. I mean, a sustained period of high inflation or, you know, a one, one off burst, but I mean, either way, you, you know, Bitcoin and every asset that has a USD denominator, every asset is massively mispriced. And, you know, on the other side of it, if Bitcoin, or, you know, we, we fix the cost of capital. Can it can it be a free market phenomenon again at some point? Yeah, of, of course. Um, but, you know, there, <laughs> I think it, it, every situation is a bit different. And, you know, in, in Israel's case, I, I'm not intimate, intimately familiar, but, right, like the U.S. The U.S. is going to, doesn't have a, you know, a massive country that's going to be giving it <laughs> bipartisan aid to also sustain its budget, right? Like, uh, in Israel's case, so. It's, it's, you know, it's not a pretty situation. And again, the, like, I really actually value, like, uh, Brent Johnson's thesis. Like, the U.S. is screwed, of course. Um, but it's screwed, actually, the least. Um, and Japan's screwed. China's screwed. Eurozone's screwed. Um, and as, as I say, you know, they're screwed as in the, the sense of their currency. Um, so, you know, the dollar can be king and gain against all these other foreign exchange currencies and still perpetually lose value against everything you want to buy. Um, and so, yeah, I think people get a little bit caught up on, you know, oh, the dollar's, you know, the dollar's strong here. And it's like, well, not really. The, you know, I just paid $7 for an energy drink. Um, <laughs> so, like, yeah, I, I, I think that either way, you're going to have, like, yeah, fixed income's repriced, but it, it's repriced in duration. It's repriced in yields. That's the real shock. What, what a lot of the fixed income funds and, you know, these like long-term investors still haven't, you know, accepted is, well, okay, you got the one-off shock and now you're in for a decade of, of a slow bleed. Um, and I, I don't think that phenomenon is actually widely understood. And that's my opinion, but maybe, you know, maybe I could be wrong. Yeah, th thanks for sharing that. And, and great question there, Frank. I think uh, Luke Roman has been someone I've been keeping my eyes on as well. I mean, for years now, and um, I think just his ability to communicate, like, the larger systemic macro picture is a little bit unsettling, but also highly informative. So, um, yeah, definitely shout out to Luke. He's been killing it. Um, but, um, Tomas, if, if you have any response on that, on that macro piece, we'd love to hear your take. Um, I do know you're kind of running into, um, a, a, a time constraint here. So I want to be respectful of that. Um, and also in addition, we'd love to hear if there's anything coming from the Kraken team, uh, post having that we might be able to look forward to. Sure. So, uh, yeah, this will be the last question I can handle, but, I've already shared a lot of the data points, at least how I think about crypto adoption and whatnot. When I think about the, the financial economy, the macro picture, whether it's U.S. or abroad, I do agree with Dylan. Like They're very linked. And so I'll, I'll use U.S. because I, I live here and I'm more familiar with it as a, a sort of the proxy for, for the global stuff. But everything that you see in the capital markets, whether it's debt, whether it's just equities, housing, etc., it's been pretty made clear since the great financial crisis of 08 that it's going to get bailed out. Um, and you can debate on how it's monetized, whether it's the Fed buying it directly or creating programs that support the banks. Uh, this is the financial economy. The TradFi industry is one built around bailouts. And the sad part is a lot of that, the ownership, the participation in those assets are concentrated in the older generations. And so what you're seeing is growing wealth disparity, growing income disparity. And unfortunately for the younger generations, that creates quite a bit of nihilism. So a lot of data that we've seen, 50 to 60% of developed country Gen Z millennials uh, believe that it's harder or impossible for them to have similar levels of financial well-being than their parents or grandparents. Um, similar metrics of Gen Z millennials who believe they can accomplish major life goals like starting a family or home ownership simply because of their economic or financial situation. And I think how this relates to crypto 
is quite simply that opt-out thesis. You have um, an, an, a TradFi industry built around bailouts where the younger generations can't really participate. And if they want to participate, like buying a home, for example, they're going to have to take on some serious debt and they're going to have to forego a lot of future quality of life stuff like discretionary spending because they're plowing so much of their earnings into servicing this debt. And when it comes to crypto, uh, what I think you're going to see is people looking to crypto as that escape hatch. They're going to buy crypto instead of traditional asset classes because they see a technology that is going to outpace the growth of the other asset classes. And so you'll see less bid from the younger generations on traditional asset classes, more bid on the crypto side, which is a powerful story, especially because um, you know people don't live forever. You're going to have these generations inherit tens of trillions of dollars, uh, over 100 trillion if you look globally over the next, call it 25, 30 years. And so I, I see a future where crypto eats the world. It's just going to take some time. Uh, but it's going to be sponsored by this shift in attitude from uh, the boomer generations and some bleed into the Gen X generation over into what Gen Z and millennials believe about just investing in general and, and how to express that. Yeah, I love it. And, and I think just speaking from like my personal perspective as a millennial as well, I, I mean, I think that your analysis is pretty spot on. If, if you ask around like my generation, I think uh, most folks would agree with you. But um, yeah, coming into the Bitcoin space, I think has been um, definitely a, a let, let me a positive outlook um, on a lot of things and just like having that um, capacity to look to the future in a positive light um, in terms of financial well-being is, is certainly great and all the knock-on effects of that too of course as I'm sure we're all aware from just how capital will then be allocated if we fix the money is is you know always a positive um, but uh, Tom, Tomas I know you got to jump uh, but just wanted to thank everyone for tuning in today this has been a really insightful conversation and um, I also just want to say you know we're really excited to putting on the Bitcoin having live stream with Kraken we're going to be talking about all of this and more, talking about the top 21 moments of the past four years and, and setting the stage for the future. Um, we're really putting a ton of effort into this live stream here at Bitcoin Magazine, and we're, we're stoked to show it with y'all. Um, like I mentioned before, we've got Davey Day Trader who'll be joining us alongside Kraken, and uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. we got more speakers coming down the pipe soon, so um, check it out at BitcoinHaving.com, and we'll see y'all there. Uh, we're starting 21 blocks before the halving, so uh, it's looking like April 19th, but... Um, who, who knows, maybe the miners will, will, uh, will comply and uh, push back a day, but uh, that's what it's looking like right now. So um, again, just wanted to thank everyone for tuning in and, and thank you to Dylan, Alan, Frank, Tomas, and the team over at, at Kraken um, for putting this on. So uh, we will see y'all in just uh, about eight days now. Um, cool, guys. Thank you. Thanks a lot, guys. <clears throat> yep. Peace.